text this evening is Psalm 45, verse 7. Psalm 45, verse <coughs> 7. The Messiah is being addressed here in these words, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This morning, beloved, the Lord fed our souls with <coughs> spiritual food and drink at the Lord's Supper. And, in connection with that, we meditated on the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ, the subject of Psalm 45, particularly from the first two verses. Tonight, we're going to consider his anointing with the oil of gladness. What is this? What does it mean that Christ is anointed with this oil of gladness above his fellows? When does this anointing take place? And we can even ask in connection with this, where did this anointing take place? And following from this, we need to consider if this anointing of Christ with the oil of gladness above his fellows is of any benefit to us. And we need to understand too the connection between Christ's being anointed with the oil of gladness and his loving righteousness and hating wickedness. The connection, therefore, between the two halves, roughly speaking, in Isaiah, or sorry, in Psalm 45, verse 7. Consider then very simply, anointed with the oil of gladness, the holy reason for it, and the beautiful and wonderful meaning of it. Anointed with the oil of gladness, the holy reason and the wonderful meaning. Our text begins with the statement about the Lord Jesus, Thou lovest righteousness. Thou lovest righteousness. And though you may not have thought of Christ and his work as being encapsulated in this brief statement, you will readily accept that this is certainly true. Even from the opening pages of the four Gospels, we can see this. What was Christ's question to his parents when they found him listening and asking questions aged 12 in the temple? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Because he loved righteousness. What was it that Christ said to John at his baptism? Suffer it to be so now. Allow me to be baptized at your hand. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And what was Christ's response to the devil's first temptation in the wilderness? It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This love of Christ for righteousness is indicated in all that we know of his training as a boy and in his early life. Luke 2 teaches us that the Lord Jesus, even though he was sinless and his parents were fallen, was subject to his mother and his adoptive father. He appreciated their godly rearing of him, though it wasn't perfect, their rearing of him. And this is a good way 
for the children of Christ, the children of this church, to show that they love righteousness by honoring their father and mother. Because the love of righteousness for children is especially encapsulated in the fifth commandment. Disobey your parents, that is to say, by your actions. I hate righteousness. I do not want to be like Jesus Christ. Consider that. The Lord Jesus, as a boy, delighted in, poured over, and memorized scripture because he loved righteousness. And God's righteousness is revealed in his word. The Lord Jesus was faithful in his attendance at divine worship on the Sabbath because this was his righteous custom. He did this week in, week out, religiously. And that was righteous. He was consistent and earnest in prayer, private prayer, prayer in his closet, because he loved righteousness. And he understood that this was God's calling for him as his son. And you can see, time and time again, <coughs> Christ's love of righteousness throughout his ministry. He was diligent in teaching the people. He faithfully trained the twelve disciples, even though he knew that one of them had a devil. He rebuked the disciples who sought to bar the covenant seat from coming to him and said, No, suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And that was righteousness on his part, to take the children of believers and bless them in his arms as the Messiah and declare that they were citizens of in the kingdom of heaven. For, according to Psalm 103, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. We can see too Jesus' love of righteousness <coughs> in his dealings with the rich young ruler. Jesus loved him. He loved him righteously. And therefore, he brought the righteousness of the law to bear upon that young man, exposing his covetousness, his love of money, in order to bring him to repentance and sorrow for sin, and thereby to salvation. But this love of righteousness in the heart of the Lord Jesus is especially seen at the cross. It was his love of righteousness that enabled him to overcome at the Garden of Gethsemane, when, contrary to his own natural, sinless disinclination to suffering, he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Realizing that there was no other way. All doors were shut to him. And that righteousness, everlasting righteousness, can only be obtained through the sacrificial death of the Son of God. This is how the Apostle Paul sums it up in Philippians 2. He humbled himself became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You can understand too that the Lord Jesus was conscious throughout his life of this high calling that he had from God. And it's expressed in that key word, obedience. He obeyed his Father. <coughs> he confessed Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That's the reason I've entered the world, to do the will of God, to obey, to obtain and achieve righteousness. 
This love of righteousness on the part of the Lord Jesus was wholly sincere. He didn't pretend to do or love righteousness like Jehu. He did righteousness. And he did righteousness because he loved righteousness, which is a greater thing than doing righteousness. He loved righteousness with all his heart, always, because he loved the righteous God every moment of the day. And so the opening words of our text constitute an affirmation of Christ's <coughs> sinlessness. The Old <coughs> Testament itself teaches the sinlessness of Jesus in these words, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest <coughs> wickedness. Words which are quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews 1 verse 8. And this is high praise of Christ. High praise of Christ from the psalmist in our text. High praise of Christ from the worshipping church as it sings Psalm 45. And even high praise of the Lord Jesus from God himself. Because this is the way our text is introduced in the quotation found in Hebrews 1. Unto the Son, He, that is God, saith, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. That was the Father's all knowing testimony about Jesus. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Hebrews 1 verse 9 in our King James Bible translates wickedness as iniquity or lawlessness. And just as the scriptures reveal to us Christ's love of righteousness, they also reveal to us his hatred of wickedness. He hated wickedness. Jesus Christ. You see this, for instance, in his cleansing the temple twice. The very beginning of his ministry and the very end of his ministry to encapsulate the whole. His was a temple cleansing ministry because he hated wickedness, especially wickedness in the temple place where God's glory was especially to dwell. And the disciples understood this too, testifying, quoting Psalm 69 with respect to this incident, the zeal of thine house hath eaten him up. He's so consumed with the zeal of God's name and the glory of his dwelling place in the temple that he purged and cleansed that rotten seat of the false church from their iniquities, those money-grubbing rebels who stole from God's house. He cleansed them and threw those wicked people out because he hated wickedness. And Christ's hatred of wickedness is evident <coughs> in his running debate, his running battle with the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees for the whole three years of his public ministry. And the longest excoriation of these filthy apostate church teachers is found in Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, because Jesus hated their wickedness. Woe unto you, God's curse, wrath and damnation fall heavily upon your heads. For you have shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. You're not interested in believing in me and enjoying the kingdom of heaven yourself. And you do your damnest 
to stop other people entering through your machinations as leaders of a false church. Woe unto you. Next verse. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you're nothing but hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, that is, you take money from some poor lady whose husband had died, and you've made her poor by taking what money was left to her in her husband's will. And for a pretense you make Lord a long prayer coming across as never so pious. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. He hated their wickedness, and he told it to their face. Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he excoriates their missionary policy. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Oh, you convert people on the mission field, but to your own false gospel and false God, and make them members of your own corrupt false church, and you've made them even worse than yourselves. Woe unto you. Which just goes to show that all that calls itself mission work does not meet with God's approval. Jesus didn't think so. And it goes on today. <coughs> then towards the end, because I spare you some of these sharper and indig indignant judgments of Christ, towards the end, Jesus sums it all up in these moving words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, speaking to these scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites as the visible leaders of the church. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, the children of Jerusalem, the elect, in that city, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. That's how wicked you are. You actually tried to stop me, the Messiah, gathering my sheep and my chickens from the visible church. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. It doesn't get any worse than that. I hate your wickedness, and I, as a son of God, call down judgment upon Jerusalem, so that you will be destroyed and your house ruined, as Jesus did in A.D. 7. Continuing through the Gospels, you may remember that the Lord reserved stinging rebukes for some of his other enemies. He called the wicked Herod Antipas, who executed John the Baptist, that fox. To the devil he commanded, get thee behind me, Satan. He hated Satan and his wickedness, and he expelled him whenever, according to God's providence, Satan had tempted Christ to three times, the Lord, passing through that trial, said, in effect, now it's over, go. But I think it's true to say that Christ's hatred of wickedness is especially seen in the lengths to which he went in order to defeat it. He went to hell on the cross in order to destroy sin and death. He descended into an unfathomable abyss of agony to defeat Satan and the world and the false church. And this same Lord Jesus revealed to us in the pages of Scripture as loving righteousness and hating wickedness has not stopped hating wickedness. And of course, everlasting punishment in hell is testimony that Christ still hates wickedness. He said to the church of Pergamos in Revelation 2, verse 15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Jesus hated the false doctrine. And he hated false doctrine in professing churches as we do, because all people who take the name of Jesus Christ upon their lips are commanded to do by virtue of the facts that they're Christians and those who are called to imitate Jesus Christ. 
And after that sharp word to the church of Pergamos, we hear this. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's another word of the Spirit. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity or hatred with God? Whosoever therefore will or wants to be the friend of the world is the enemy of God and therefore also the enemy of Christ. Which calls us as Christians who believe the word of God to watch out and avoid like the plague the sweeter than honey false Jesuses. And the false Jesus is known amongst other things in that he does not hate false doctrine or worldliness. He tolerates, loves and promotes it and blesses it. The false Jesus is known because he loves pretty much everything, no matter how vile. And he loves everybody. And whereas the true Jesus will say to many on the last day, even many who claim to be Christians, this is the context in Matthew 7, I never knew you. I have never loved you once at any time in my life. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So the man made Jesus who deceives multitudes must be rejected and repudiated by us as Christians as a worthless, lying idol. Beware of him and the false shepherds who preach such a Jesus. Now it's crucial that both of the truths of our text are held together. The testimony of the Spirit of God concerning the Messiah is Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. The church and the believer must not follow a Jesus who loves righteousness without hating wickedness. There's such a thing isn't actually possible. You can't love righteousness without hating wickedness. But you know what I mean. This Jesus, who loves righteousness without hating wickedness, is the Jesus of many churches and many professing Christians. That Jesus couldn't whip up an iota of indignation against any wickedness whatsoever, unless perhaps it was sexual abuse of small children, and even then it's debatable. This Jesus, however, is not the one described in the four Gospels. He's not the one prophesied in the Old Testament, including Psalm 50, 45, verse 7. And he is emphatically not the Jesus who will judge the world at the last day, the one who loves righteousness, who will grant by grace the new heavens and the new earth for the elect, and the ones who hates wickedness, and who will usher the wicked into the lake of fire. This is the Jesus, described in Psalm 45, verse 7, the one who will sit on the great white throne, about whom God can truly say, Thou lovest righteousness, and thou hatest wickedness. The real Jesus, the only Jesus. And on the other hand, the church and the believer must not follow <coughs> A Jesus who hates wickedness without loving righteousness. Now this error you'll understand is less frequent, but it is possible that some fall into it, whereby they're merely nasty and abusive and offensive. Now since the true Jesus both loves righteousness and hates wickedness, the child of God must do both, not just one. You're not called to hate wickedness merely, or to love righteousness 
only. Amos 5.15 commands us, hate the evil and love the good. And this means too that we must, must do both commensurately or proportionately. I explain what I mean. Someone who professes a great love for righteousness but who has little hatred of wickedness you know automatically there is something wrong here. This does not add up. And someone on the other hand who declares that he has a great hatred of wickedness but he only has a very little love for righteousness then there's something wrong there too. You could say this would be accurate. That we love righteousness in so far as we hate wickedness, and we hate wickedness in so far as we love righteousness. The two go hand in hand, love of righteousness, hatred of wickedness, and they are commensurate. And the Christian's calling is in submission to the word of God, which determines what's good and what's evil, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to do both. Love righteousness, hate wickedness, together for Christ's sake, because He, our Savior and our example, did both, and because we love Him. And God rewarded Jesus for this. God rewarded Jesus precisely for this in our text, His love of righteousness and his hatred of wickedness. And in both these things lies his sinlessness and his qualification to be our saviour and to obtain the righteousness of God for all of his elect. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now what is this anointing? <coughs> this anointing with oil. Well the Bible speaks of anointing with oil in two main senses. First of all there is the ordinary common anointing with oil. When someone would put oil on their head so that their face would shine and luster would be added to their countenance. Psalm 104 verse 15 refers to this. Then there is the sacred or official use of oil in anointing in which someone is appointed to an office. The oil then symbolizes the Holy Spirit who calls and equips for that office. Now here in Psalm 45 verse 7 it's the latter. The anointing in connection with someone's being appointed and equipped for office. And the office here is not the office of a priest as such or the office of a prophet. It is the office of King, as we saw this morning, because the imagery of Psalm 45 is regal throughout. For instance, verse 1, I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. So when did this anointing of Jesus Christ, spoken of in our text, when did it take place? <coughs> From our reading of the four gospel accounts, there are various possibilities that suggest themselves. We know that Jesus was endowed with the Holy Spirit at his very conception. The Holy Ghost overshadowed the Virgin Mary so that she conceived one who is the Son of God and that man, Christ Jesus, was kept 
from original or actual sin. We know second that this Lord Jesus grew in wisdom and grace as he advanced in age. He was anointed especially at his baptism when the Spirit of God descended upon him as it were in the form of a dove and remained upon him, calling and equipping and enabling him to serve in his office as the Messiah in his public ministry. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus was equipped in his human nature by the Holy Ghost throughout his public ministry. But our text doesn't refer to any of these four instances of the Spirit's work upon Jesus according to his humanity. The anointing which is spoken of in our text occurred at Christ's <coughs> exaltation. This is easy to prove. Verse 7 begins, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Christ's life is described as loving righteousness and hating wickedness, and God rewards him for it. Therefore, since you have obeyed me, I will anoint thee with the oil of gladness. This means that we can compare the bestowals of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus Christ in our morning and evening sermons, in our two texts for today. Verse 2, which we looked at this morning, refers to Christ's receiving the Holy Spirit on earth in the days of his humiliation. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips by the Holy Spirit in order to equip him for his work on earth. In verse 7, the scene moves from earth to heaven, from Christ's humiliation to his exaltation. And it says, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And here the anointing of the Spirit is a reward for his work on earth. And you may have noticed as I read verses 2 and 7 that both texts contain the word therefore. And the word therefore is the same in Hebrew in both instances. In verse 2, grace is poured into thy lips to enable Christ to be faithful on earth. Therefore, God blesses him forever. He is rewarded for his obedience, which was enabled by the grace of the Spirit while on earth. And then in verse 7, Christ loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, he's given the Spirit as his reward. Now we can be even more specific as regards the time of this anointing in Psalm 45 verse 7. We've said that it was during his exaltation. To be more specific, the anointing of verse 7 occurred at the time of his taking his seat at God's right hand. In verse 6, the psalmist Addressing the Messiah says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a righteous scepter. That's the coronation of Jesus. Verse 7, in connection with that, says, God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Verses 6 and 7 are to be taken together 
in this sense. And this is even clearer in Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9, which quotes verses 6 and 7 of Psalm 45 together. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. You've been given a scepter of righteousness as the scepter of thy kingdom. And God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So this anointing in our text occurs at Christ's coronation immediately following his ascension into heaven. Remember, Christ's glorification consists first of all of his resurrection from the dead. Then, 40 days later, he ascends into heaven, whereupon, thirdly, he sits at God's right hand, given rulership of the entire universe, and it's at that point that Christ is anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. And the word gladness seems to be explained. It's not just anointing with the Spirit, but the Spirit has the oil of gladness. And so we must picture the scene, as far as we're able, with our dull earthly minds, but we'll try. Jesus Christ, the King of glory, enters heaven through the everlasting doors, as they're called in Psalm 24. At this point, therefore, all of his sufferings and trouble and distress and anguish are over for good. And he's very happy about it. He has successfully finished the entire work on earth that the Father gave him to do. And he's glad, as well as being relieved. He is at this stage, therefore, vindicated, triumphant, and exalted. He's rejoicing. He's given his reward, his everlasting reward. He is glorified in his human nature, and he's glad. And his coronation, which is a joyous occasion for any king, takes place in the presence of all the Old Testament saints who are themselves far happier than they were on, even on the day when they died and lifted up their eyes being in glory. All the church is looking on, the church triumphant in heaven. The holy angels are there. I was almost going to say all the holy angels, but yet the scripture says that the angels preserve and keep the flock of Christ on earth. So there must have been some of them, one assumes, looking after they missed out that day, but doubtless they were filled in later. The holy angels were there, rejoicing even more fervently than they did when the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation, as Job 38 explains. And there's Jesus before the saints and the angels. He's invested with the kingdom of God and rulership over the entire universe, seated on his throne with the scepter placed in his hand and the crown upon his head, and he is anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. It's a glad and happy and joyful scene. That's the picture of the text, borrowing imagery from the idea of the coronation of an earthly monarch or potentate. <coughs> the Lord Jesus, in the days of his pilgrimage <coughs> on earth, was sustained by this sure hope of the joy and gladness which would be bestowed upon him. During his humiliation and suffering on the cross, this thought kept him from being swallowed up with overmuch grief, kept him from failing in his task. Hebrews 12 verse 2 exhorts us that we must look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who 
for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In the midst of all that misery and agony, he believed, joy will be mine. In the midst of all that shame, when he was reviled and despised, he said, my glory is coming. I must hang in there and persevere. <coughs> in Hebrews 12, verse 2, is stated for our encouragement and example. We are to look unto a Jesus who in his suffering and shame thought of the joy that was before him and so persevered. Because we too will reign with Jesus Christ and share in his joy, precisely the same joy, though not to the same extent, of course, because he's anointed beyond <coughs> anything that any Christian could ever sustain. And all of this helps us to evaluate the idea, which is especially prevalent in historic Roman Catholicism, that the Lord Jesus Christ, while on earth, was always, or almost always, bright, cheery, and joyful, that he was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows while on earth. That's a wrong view of Jesus. Because Psalm 45, verse 7, and Christ's anointing with the oil of gladness above his fellows belongs to his coronation. It's a reward for his earthly obedience, his always loving righteousness and always hating wickedness. Therefore, God granted him this rich bestowal of the Spirit. While on earth, the Lord Jesus looked forward to the joy that would be his as his reward. And so in Christ's Stephen's humiliation, while on earth, he is characterized as the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Whereas on his exaltation, he's anointed with the joy, with the oil of gladness above his family. And my point here is not to justify or even encourage gloominess to say that it is virtuous for us to be down or live in hardship or despair, <coughs> not that sort of thing. My point here is that we must understand the Lord Jesus in his work. While he was on earth, that, those were the days of his humiliation. Legally, for our sake, he was guilty, guilty. And therefore, God made his condition wretched while on earth because he's bearing our sins. The curse and suffering due to us lies upon him. And then, when Christ ascends into heaven in his exaltation, he's legally righteous. And his condition, what he experiences and feels, reflects his righteousness so his condition is not merely blessed, but glorious and filled with joy and gladness. And in this too, Jesus Christ is our example. This world for the Christian is one of humiliation. The world doesn't even recognize us as the sons of God. But then it wouldn't, would it? Because it didn't even recognize the Son of God when he came to earth. And the joy of the Christian lies primarily in the world to come. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Some of it here, but the fulfillment, the much greater fulfillment, <coughs> is in the next world, even as it was with the man Christ Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is now in heaven, anointed with this oil of gladness above his Fellows. The greater gladness is his 
than any earthly king at his coronation, or than even his saints, us, the righteous, when we go to glory. Way more, way more than his fellows. But the word fellows here, I believe, doesn't so much talk about earthly kings. The word fellows refers to us who share with him, both in his humiliation and in his exaltation. And this text calls us the fellows of Christ, his companions, his associates. That's our privilege, our prerogative to be the fellows of Jesus Christ, according to his human nature. We're his brethren, we're his children, we're his friends, his fellows, his companions. And it's significant. This statement that I made, that we are Christ's fellows by grace, according to his human nature. Look closely at verse 6. Jesus Christ there is addressed as God, according to his divine nature. Thy throne, O God, spoken to Jesus, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right kingdom, a right scepter. And then, in verse 7, God is referred to as Christ's God. And therefore, Christ is spoken of in that place according to his human nature. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness, therefore God, thy God, because the eternal Son doesn't have a God, but Christ according to his human nature does have a God, the God he trusted in and hoped in, the God he worshipped and served and obeyed. God, thy God, hath anointed thee the oil of gladness above thy fellows. One divine person with divine characteristics as God, human characteristics as man. And so he is spoken of this Jesus according to either nature. As we saw on a recent Wednesday night, this is the communication of properties in our Saviour. And now it's striking that the reference in Psalm 45 to his receiving the Spirit the references are both according to his human nature. Verse 2, thou art fairer than the children of men. You're a man, and you're more lovely than all men. Grace is poured into thy lips as a human being with a mouth and tongue like ours. Therefore God has blessed thee in the human nature forever. Similarly, verse 7, Christ loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed Christ in his human nature with the oil of gladness above his fellows. Other men whom God gave to him as his church. And it's important too that our text here, which addresses this Christ as, G as God in verse 6 and as man in verse 7, is emphatically called here the Messiah. That's what the word anointed means. This one who is God and man is anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. He's the anointed, the Messiah, the Christ. And he is that especially on his exaltation at the Father's right hand in heaven because the anointing of the Spirit that he receives then is the greatest anointing which he received heretofore. Acts 2, 34, Peter's sermon on Pentecost. David is not ascended up into the heavens. But David saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. The coronation of Christ. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. God has made him Christ because God has anointed him even more fully than he did on earth with the oil of gladness above his fellows. And all of this, with this point I close the moment, is for our advantage. Jesus is blessed and anointed for his own benefit. He is rewarded. He deserves it. And for our benefit too. Lord's Day 12 of our Heidelberg Catechism asks, Why is he called Christ? 
that is anointed. Because he is ordained of God the Father and anointed with the Holy Ghost to be our chief prophet and teacher, who fully reveals the secret counsel of God to us, and as our only high priest who sacrifices for us, and the one we're especially interested in now, he is our eternal king, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who defends and preserves us in the enjoyment of that salvation he has purchased for us. And then the follow-up question, why is he called a Christian? Why are you called a Christian? Because I'm a member of Christ by faith, and thus I am a partaker of his anointing. So that I may cling to in Christ, and that I may fight against sin and Satan in this life, and afterwards reign with him eternally over all creatures. Our calling is simple, therefore. Love righteousness as kings in Christ. Hate wickedness according to your royal office. Thereby imitate and fellowship with Jesus Christ. And look forward to the joy of the Lord when we shall sit with him in his throne. Amen.